Hello everyone. Welcome to the third episode of Lopit. Today's discussion is about the Paris Agreement which was concluded in the month of December 2015. This agreement is considered to be one of the most important international instruments in the pursuit towards curbing climate change. Its importance can be understood in the fact that not one or two but nearly 195 countries have come together in order to negotiate and adopt it. In today's video, let's deliberate about the objectives of this agreement and the measures which it has put in place in order to achieve them. Additionally, we should also understand various important features of this agreement, which would be quite interesting to know. The objectives of Paris Agreement are quite simple. What it seeks to achieve is to limit the average global temperature by 2 degrees Celsius or if possible by 1.5 degrees Celsius. In order to understand this objective, please have a look at the following data. Our average global temperature during the pre-industrial era was 13.6 degrees Celsius. The time period which I refer to when I use the word pre-industrial era is between 1850s to 1900s or in other words the 18th century. So our global temperature during the 18th century was 13.6 degrees Celsius. This global temperature has increased by 1 degree Celsius and has reached 14.6 degrees Celsius in the year 2013. Now Paris Agreement seeks to not let this temperature increase by more than 2 degrees in comparison to what it was during the pre-industrial era. So if it was 13.6 degrees in the 18th century, Paris Agreement doesn't want this to increase by more than 2 degrees, which would be 15.6 degrees Celsius. In order to achieve this objective, Paris Agreement has designed or developed three strategies. Let us look at each one of them. The first one is known as vindication of climate change. The second one is providing climate finance. And the third one is a review mechanism which is going to check whether the first two measures are being properly achieved or not. Let us look in detail with respect to each of these measures. The first measure is with respect to mitigating climate change. What it means as its name itself suggests is to put a break on all those activities which have an impact or which have an adverse impact towards our climate. So in order to do this without imposing any coercion or any force on any country, the Paris Agreement has designed a independent or uh, a discretionary model for each and every country where they can submit what is known as Intended Nationally Determined Contributions or INDCs. Allow me to explain this to you in very simple terms. What this means is that every country who is a party to Paris Agreement will submit a report to the Paris Agreement stating that by so and so year we will reduce our carbon emissions by so and so percentage in comparison to so and so year of the past. For instance, India has submitted before the Paris Agreement negotiations that it has three goals. The first one is to reduce the greenhouse emissions by up to 35% by 2030 in comparison to what was present in 2005 levels. For example, if India's carbon emissions in 2005 were let us say up to 1 ton of carbon dioxide, then by 2030, India wants to reduce it by 35%. So India's carbon emissions in the year 2030 should not be more than uh, 65%. The second goal of India is to achieve 40% of electricity from non-fuel based energy sources. This means that India wants to generate electricity from solar, hydro, or wind or any other source of um, renewable source of energies instead of using fossil fuels uh, such as uh, coal. The third objective of India is to create additional carbon storage sinks which is which are also known as carbon sinks and thereby absorb 2.5 to 3 billion tons of CO2. Carbon sinks are nothing but trees. Trees have a capability of absorbing CO2 and emitting oxygen during their photosynthesis process. So what India seeks to achieve is to plant more and more trees so that more and more carbon sinks are formed in our country which have the potential of absorbing nearly 2.5 to 3 billion tons of CO2. The second measure which the Paris Agreement has instilled is known as providing climate finance. 
before we understand this concept of providing climate finance let us uh, try and reflect as to why do we even require climate finance in the first place developing countries like india and many other countries which are in the pursuit towards becoming a developed country have a slight disadvantage in comparison to developed countries while developed countries were establishing themselves they didn't have any kind of prohibitions or restrictions in the form of environmental controls etc and hence they could exploit the natural resources without any kind of prohibitions however india would have would be facing a lot of problems because of paris agreement uh, since it has to not only uh, exploit its natural resources but it has to exploit it in such a way that it doesn't cause any harm to the environment so in other words india has to pay for what damage has been done by those developed countries so in order to balance this asymmetry between developed and developing nations and in order to please the developing nations to come and join this agreement paris agreement of paris agreement has designed a uh, measure which is known as providing climate finance so why this measure developed countries should provide money to developing countries in order to achieve their goals of uh, of achieve their goals which they have mentioned in their own indcs this would definitely help india in financing a green economy please understand one thing that why this measure india would be receiving lots of funds from the developed countries in order to go green in order to achieve that 40% of electricity uh, via non renewable sources etc and in order to have large amount of plantations and in order to cut the emissions by 35% by 2030 india will be receiving lot of funds from uh, developed countries and this is one of the primary reasons why india uh, or any other developing nation for that matter would be willing to join the paris agreement and cut down their emissions despite knowing that doing so would be costly uh, for their own economic development uh, let us just look at uh, our prime minister's speech where he mentions the importance of providing climate finance where he mentions the importance of requiring uh, funds from the developed countries in order to achieve his own aims which he has mentioned in indcs responsibility to make clean energy available affordable and accessible to all the developing world this is in our collective interest so we look to the developed countries to mobilize 100 billion us dollars annually by 2020 for mitigation and adoption in the developing country so there you go our prime minister was demanding the developed countries to honor the commitment under the paris agreement which is to provide 100 billion us dollars to the developing countries by 2020 now such provision of funds is necessary because in the absence of it the developing countries should incur all the cost of going green or making their economy sustainable by themselves such cost would have definitely deterred the developing countries to come and join the paris agreement hence in order to remove this deterrence and in order to incentivize all the developing countries the paris agreement has created this new formula where it starts or where it uh, pledges that the developed countries will start funding the developing countries in order to reach their own indcs and this measure has solely been responsible in order to attract 195 countries to come and participate and adopt the paris agreement now let's move to the third measure which the paris agreement has put in place in order to achieve its objective and this measure is known as the review mechanism why the review mechanism the paris agreement has created two modes the first one is a transparency agreements why the transparency agreements every country has to submit their data with respect to uh, their emissions and with respect to their targets which they want to achieve and how are they making or developing their policies in order to achieve those targets in other words every country should be completely transparent with respect to its emissions 
so that every other country which is a party or which is um, may be a party or may not be a party uh, but the idea is this that every country should be very transparent with respect to uh, what they're emitting and what they want to achieve and how are they going to achieve it the second thing is known as global stock take what global stock take does is that it takes into account all of these transparency transparency agreements it sits once in five years and it discusses how the progress is uh, moving towards uh, reaching the objective of Paris Agreement. It starts implementing various measures wherein it tries to persuade various countries or all the countries in order to set much more ambitious INDCs than what was set earlier. So these are the three measures which the Paris Agreement has put in place in order to achieve its objective of uh, limiting the global average temperature by 2 degrees Celsius from what it was present during the pre-industrial era. Now let us just look at some of the most important things about the Paris Agreement. These important things would help us understand the Paris Agreement in a much more uh, broadened manner and it would also help us widen our understanding with respect to international environmental law. The first one is the common but differentiated responsibilities principle. The Paris Agreement is based on this principle and this principle is considered to be one of the most important international environmental law principles which is present till date. The idea behind this principle is very simple. Uh, see, the climate change is not the result of each and every country. It is caused by some selected countries and we refer to these selected countries as the developed nations. Although every country in this world has a responsibility towards climate change, this responsibility cannot be the same. India cannot have the same responsibility as that of USA what amount of pollution or what amount of climate change the USA has caused it has not been caused by India so although India has a responsibility towards acting or India has a responsibility to act towards climate change it res its responsibility is not as high as that of USA hence the responsibility towards climate change is common but this responsibility is differentiated amongst different states depending upon the amount of pollution which is caused by those states and the ability that those developed states have in order to reduce this pollution. That is the idea behind common but differentiated responsibilities and Paris Agreement is based on this. This is the reason why Paris Agreement allows providing of funds from developed countries to developing countries because it recognizes that the responsibility of developing countries is definitely less in comparison to what uh, the developing co developed countries have. The second important thing to know is that the Paris Agreement uh, is an outcome of United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change 1992 or in other words UNFCC. UNFCC uh, conducts conferences on pollution uh, uh, very often or for that matter uh, each and every year and uh, it was in the 21st conference of the parties to the UNFCC that the Paris Agreement has come into existence. This 21st conference happened in France and hence Paris Agreement is also referred as COP21 which is the short form for Conference of Parties 21. Other important things include uh, whether uh, the Paris Agreement is legally binding or not. Uh, this is a, f a fairly interesting topic and uh, Paris Agreement is partially legally binding. Uh, we can say that it's partially legally binding because every party to Paris Agreement must and should submit its INDCs, must and should be transparent uh, with respect to declaration of how much amount of emissions it is emitting each and every year. However, a country need not meet its goals which are present in its INDCs. So the only legal binding nature of this Paris Agreement is that a country must submit an INDC and must be transparent with respect to its emissions. However, it need not meet the goals which it has set for itself in its own INDCs. So this is the legal binding character of Paris Agreement. It's not completely legal, legally binding and uh, due to this reason it has received a lot of criticism. But if it was made completely legally binding, it would never come into effect. So the second question is whether the Paris Agreement is in effect. Uh, 
पैरिस एग्रीमेंट इज नॉट इन एफेक्ट इट विल बी इन एफेक्ट आफ्टर इट इज ओपन फॉर सिग्नेचर ऑन ट्वेंटी सेकेंड अप्रैल टू थाउजेंड एंड सिक्सटीन इट विल कम इन टू एफेक्ट ओनली वेन फिफ्टी फाइव कंट्रीज दैट प्रोड्यूस एटलीस्ट फिफ्टी फाइव परसेंट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड ग्रीन हाउस गैस इमिशंस रेटिफाई द एग्रीमेंट ओनली इफ दैट हैपन्स द पैरिस एग्रीमेंट विल कम इन टू एफेक्ट द लास्ट थिंग विच आई वुड लाइक टू इन्फॉर्म यू गिवन द फैक्ट दैट वी आर डिस्कसिंग अबाउट एनवायरमेंटल लॉ आवर करेंट मिनिस्टर फॉर एनवायरमेंट आई एम रिफरिंग टू आवर सेंट्रल मिनिस्टर फॉर एनवायरमेंट इज मिस्टर प्रकाश जावेदकर सो दिस एंड्स आर डिस्कशन ऑन पैरिस एग्रीमेंट थैंक यू सो मच फॉर लिसनिंग फॉर एनी मोर इन्फॉर्मेशन रिगार्डिंग दिस टॉपिक यू कैन ऑलवेज विजिट यू एन एफ सी सी डॉट कॉम एस्पेशली द दिस लिंक विच इज़ नोन एज न्यूज रूम डॉट यू एन एफ सी सी डॉट आई एन टी स्लैश पैरिस द लिंक इज ऑल्सो प्रेजेंट इन द डिस्क्रिप्शन टू दिस वीडियो वी वुड ऑल्सो थैंक स्पेशली आर फ्रेंड साधक रहेजा हु हैज़ गिवन एज दिस आइडिया ऑफ रिकॉर्डिंग आर पी पी टीज एंड अपलोडिंग द सेम ऑन यूट्यूब थैंक यू सो मच फॉर लिसनिंग इफ यू आर फाउंड आर वीडियोज़ टू बी हेल्पफुल प्लीज़ कॉमेंट एंड सब्सक्राइब थैंक यू